Um, yeah, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation and the possibility to discuss this issue here, because I have to admit that with my colleagues in Europe, it's somehow difficult to do that. Um, I obviously called the session the rediscovery of Jewish craftsmanship, because it has been elaborated already at the turn of the 19th to the 20th century. Some of uh, Jewish authors already dealt with, dealt with this issue, especially um, in connection with everyday life, and also on the basis of a general economic overview of Jewish activities. Um, one, the book by Mark Wischnitzer um, is particularly dedicated to the um, gen genesis of guilds and um, shares a, a variety of um, yeah, um, developments in different countries, um, however only um, yeah, elaborating the topic itself for the uh, country I'm interested in, I'm interested in Poland, uh, only a little bit. Um, Jewish, um, Jewish communities in Poland were the result of two migration streams. On the one hand, Jews migrated from the borders of the Kiev or Rus, and on the other hand, uh, there's what, it was the result of the expulsion uh, from the Western and Central Europe. Mostly setting, settling in smaller communities and in the countryside, which then also appears in the 18th century when Jews settled again in the countryside, moving from the cities. Um, first, the first bigger Polish centers of Jewry developed. That's a picture. No, sorry. Okay, my mistake. Uh, the first bigger Polish centers developed. Um, during the 15th century. Even though um, Jews were expelled from Central and Western Europe, contacts were still active, especially with the countries of Spain, Germany, and Bohemia. Um, <clears throat> those cities that were important to Jews were mostly Warsaw, Posna, Krakow, and Lublin. Interestingly enough, many Jews also settled at the border of um, Russia, which uh, led later on to the genesis of rural crafts, where Jews were quite active. That's a picture of Krakow from the 16th century. Krakow itself developed uh, from the 19th to the 10th century onwards as an economical center um, with wide ranging contacts, um, for example, to the Euro Asian continent. We know that the first Jewish community in Krakow developed in the 12th century. We also have a confirmation um, somehow of that with the mentioning of a rabbi that has been active there in the first half of the 13th century. However, Krakow was not the first center, obviously. It was Wotsbach, but today we don't have any sources that would um, discuss that issue further because um, the sources that remained in the archives have been eliminated during the Second World War. So all the things we have on Jewry are not, um, cannot be accessed in Wotsbach. Um, the first rights for Jews in Poland were granted by Duke Boleslaw of Kalisz in 1264, resulting in a very tight organization of Jewish communities, according on the one hand to Jewish law and then the protection of the local kahal. Jewish community, uh, Jews lived obviously in ghettos, uh, but also obviously wanted uh, by both religious groups um, preached by rabbis as well as priests. Um, uh, the segregation was quite deep-seated, going beyond geographical placement. So Jews tended to live, I don't know if it works, yeah, it works, uh, tended to live also in the old town of the city, um, but were later on <coughs> uh, expelled to Kazimierz, what today is known as a Jewish quarter. However, Kazimierz has never been a Jewish quarter per se. Um, at the beginning, mostly small to medium size uh, workshops were established there with uh, Christian artisans uh, only being um, equivalent in the language. So Kazimierz is a um, quarter which mostly, or where mostly Polish, where the mo Polish language was mostly used. Um, due to the developments, first of all, the um, First of all, the um, 
crusades that struck um, Krakow in the 15th century, as well as uh, rebuilding or um, yeah, the rebuilding of the university at that time, um, Jews became expelled from the city. Um, they were, there were a lot of riots against Jews, and especially in contact with students, uh, Jews had bigger problems. Interestingly enough, through the Crusades, um, there were also riots and fire in the city. Um, mostly uh, Christian artisans participated in there um, against the Jews. However, it is um, interesting that the king, thank you so much. The king uh, um, asked them or just told them they have to reimburse the Jews for the things that they destroyed. Also, not only with objects, but also with a lot of money, they had to refinance them. Um, the first, um, what do I have here? No, sorry, I don't need that. <laughs> the first, uh, the first Jews we find in Krakow um, are at the beginning of the 16th century. Obviously, starting with what was most essential um, to the Jewish communities. So we find obviously butchers as well as textile trades. That are, of course, um, the main um, the main trades where Jews were active. So we have for Krakow a statistical. Um, we have statistical data that says one third of all Jews were working in the textile trades and in the countryside two thirds um, were working in that um, craft. However, most of the Jews tended to work around those crafts. We have another part than the metal working, metal working or metal producing uh, crafts. Um, that were quite interested. Um, that were quite interesting here to mention. Obviously, the goldsmith that did a lot of um, that did a lot of work, and also where where the goods were exported to cities in um, Central Europe, for example, Nuremberg. We do have some pieces of uh, jewelry from Krakow where we can distinguish um, that they were made by Jews, and um, but it's only a small amount that was mostly acquired by the museums at the turn of the 19th to the 20th century. I will refer to that issue later on. Um, so, urban guilds, so Jews basically settled on the one hand as urban guilds and on the other hand as rural guilds. And the appearance um, of Krakow was one of the first. We do have uh, later on um, craft guilds that are appearing in Poznan, for example, but only in the mid of the 17th century. So Krakow was the first one. Even though in, contra in contrast to Christian guilds, Krakow was the latest one who had uh, guilds. To the organization and structure of Jewish guilds. As I'm viewing that whole thing from the perspective of um, guild history, obviously, um, the rabbi played a very important role, which cannot be defined, or at least cannot be defined in that way in Christian guilds. Religion, however, was very important to all guilds, all crafts, um, resulting, for example, in Christian, in Christian cases, in building altars or churches. And in Jewish cases, we have um, the distinction, or in the sources, we know that we have on the one hand very wealthy crafts. Um, so the Jews were capable of building own synagogues and praying rooms, for example. And on the other hand, uh, we have quite poor ones, especially from journey accounts that tell us that uh, Jews needed to uh, sell homemade goods or could only sell homemade goods because of the trade restrictions, um, they were not capable of uh, yeah, having a greater impact on economy. Interestingly enough, um, journeyman's, uh, journeymen had the same position in Jewish communities so, um, as they had in Christian ones. They always had a quite low standard, and we do find Jewish um, sorry, journeyman's associations um, that were basically uh, responsible for religious and social activities, so giving money to the poor, as well as um, caring for the praying rooms. Um, one interesting source we do have beyond letters, for example, and uh, other kinds of um, and yeah, roles where 
um, journeymen enlisted themselves. Uh, pinkers or minute books uh, where guilds um, could define first of all guild regulations, then the admissions of uh, new members, um, monthly or annual accounts, and so on. Interestingly enough, it's the only source we do have somehow comparable to Christian guilds, but the actual issue is here that we only know the outcome. We never have kind of uh, storytelling what really did happen, but we do have um, uh, yeah, the result in the sense that um, how much members had to pay if they missed to go to the synagogue and all this stuff. Interestingly enough, we also know about guilds who um, had members that left the guild uh, because they couldn't um, follow their religious um, activities anymore, which leads us to the question, um, there's something called illicit workers in craftsmanship, um, where, um, yeah, where artisans were banned or excluded from guilds but couldn't work anymore because they didn't have the rights or were at least, um, yeah, challenged by most of the guilds as not being a proper kind of craftsmanship. And the last one I would like to show you are some examples because we have actually the issue like I already, or I don't know if I mentioned it, but the issue is that we can't really distinguish um, especially works of Goldsmith, till it, uh, because it was quite common till the 16th and 17th century that also Christians um, produced um, those objects, religious objects mostly. And one of this is here, um, this is a Jewish wedding ring found recently as um, in a somehow treasure in Erfurt and Coma at the French border. And it is interesting because it has been, um, or it is dated back to the time of the Black Death. Um, so as a kind of uh, safety, Jews uh, just hid the hint, hit a, sorry, hide uh, the treasure. And um, that's one example. I mean, we do have, for example, a lot of um, Jewish crafts in Italy, um, but they are far later on than the ring stated. Another issue uh, would be, like here from the Ukraine, uh, some uh, religious elements which are obviously, may, uh, which can be traced back to Jewish artisans, comparing on the one hand Jewish um, or elements of Jewish culture and on the other one elements of a recent style, so to say. Um, but that's the whole issue, that's the only things we do have. Um, so if we are going into museums and look at it, we do have a range of 18th to 19th century objects. We don't have something from the 16th century, it's actually quite hard to find. And the issue is actually that some museums, especially in Europe, um, won't admit they have those things. I know of a case in Nuremberg where a friend of mine um, asked uh, the curator and he said, yeah, well, we do have three pieces, but we don't show them. And if she wouldn't have told me, I wouldn't have known. So it's kind of difficult here. Another problem is that there was an exhibition in Berlin called Die Gute Polizei. Um, so that during the Nazi period, many of those objects were reused. Um, for example, a lot of boxes uh, that had been made um, and that had also religious importance, um, beyond the fact that they were very, very artisanal, of course, and beautiful. Um, so we can't really distinguish or get those, um, yeah, get those objects anymore, because they are now um, yeah, used for another reason. And another thing is, I don't know, I guess you already <laughs> you know that, because um, in Prague there was a museum who was intended during the Nazi period to show uh, what Jewish life has been. And they tried to collect those items, but unfortunately it is not clear to us what happened to those items beyond the Second World War, because we can't find them in the museum. It's not possible to get there. Um, some of them, I know they don't have it anymore, and some of that got back to, if possible, to the families. 
but we don't know if that already or if that was all or if they still have it and just don't show it. And another issue is that it was not uncommon for um, for Christian guilds at least. So I think all the everyday objects to melt it or to sell it in needs of uh, in times of need when they needed money. So it's kind of uh, difficult to get the objects, um, which is actually a quite big issue because in contrast to Christian guilds, we do have. Um, sources, written sources, and no objects. And in Christian guilds, we do have uh, a lot of uh, sources, but no written accounts. So it's uh, kind of an interesting mixture here. And that's actually the end of my presentation. Thank you very much.